tonight at eight o'clock I will do a performance here uh, of a piece that I've been making all year called Future Perfect and it's for high order ambisonics. Um, I will play and spatialize and granulate sound across everybody's smartphone and then also for film and uh, the film has been uh, made for virtual reality experience so um, there's a will be a version coming out where you can watch the whole experience the whole thing in virtual reality um, so I'm going to start by explaining a bit about the background to that project and how it led to the developments for the smartphone uh, work and Benjamin um, is uh, employed at earcam and he's written the code that drives the whole cell phone uh, network here and so on that aspect we've collaborated in terms of what I wanted to achieve and, and he's going to talk a little more about the code and the, the technical framework for that. Um, so the piece is called Future Perfect. Um, as Ludger just explained to us, um, I was um, awarded a, a residency between ECAM and ZKM for this year, which I was extremely excited about. Um, and I proposed this idea of this piece called Future Perfect. And I've been working um, in virtual reality for some years now. And I've been doing a lot of work documenting um, national parks and nature spaces and then bringing those to school children, aged people in the hospitals and so on and so forth. And I, and I started also exploring creating animations in virtual reality and I was really interested about this kind of porous seam between these ideas of virtual reality as a kind of documentation space and also as a surreal imagined space. And so I propose these two thoughts here, one that nature as we know it may in the near future only exist in virtual reality, in other words, the, the captures that I've been making may well be of landscapes that disappear. Um, and also that there's, there's this kind of hyper real imaginative world that's technologically mediated that can feel very real, but is at the same time a construction. And so that came into thinking about nature itself and how in Paris and in Karlsruhe, um, we have parks in the cities and we can go to these parks and we think that we're sitting in nature, but of course we're sitting in a construction. We're sitting in the city in something that was built where the trees were planted and the flowers were put there intentionally. And we think of this as natural, but in fact it's completely constructed environment. And so I'm really interested in listening and sound and I, I run the Acoustic Ecology Lab at Arizona State University. And I coined this term, somophony um, a few years ago, which was the idea that when you sit down or I like to lie down when I'm doing field recordings and just listen for a long time, like two or three hours, there's a point at which you stop thinking about the body and the body kind of disappears. And then you really enter into this long, this sense of just being present with the sound. And I like to think of this as where the kind of cognitive, you know, the brain processing has disappeared and you're just, the whole body is listening. You sense the sonic environment that you're inhabiting. So I also wanted to somehow bring that experience of this kind of um, sublime ex experience of listening into this work as well. And this idea of really being present. And then there are two other um, thoughts that really influence this work. And one is this Swedish geographer Hagerstrand, and I love this quote where he says, the big tapestry that nature is weaving is woven because all things have a temporal vector that a mesh. And this is really important, and this is actually where the cell phones really come into play here, is the idea that in nature, if we're, if we're out in a natural environment, um, all these things are interacting and over time they all interact in a mesh in some way that forms what we call nature, this kind of the, the, the um, what do you call it? Not the object, yeah, all right, the object, the, the phenomena that we think of as nature. And so this notion of a meshment is something that is really important to me. And as I'll mention a little bit later, when we're sitting in here and working with say high order ambisonics, we often have this sense that the sound is out there and we have a really beautiful sound field and we're in it observing it, but we're not actively part of it, right? We're an observer. 
And the other um, thought here is this idea of, of systems being really dynamic and interacting and codependent. Um, so I've spent this year three months at the beginning of the year working at EARCAM in Studio One making this piece and of course the great pleasure of having this room to myself a lot over the last three months um, and composing this work um, and really thinking about these ideas of nature as a construction, how I bring that experience to you, my personal concerns about climate impact and also of course the, the, the technical challenges which are about space and composing sound in space and all of the contemplation that comes with that. So when we're thinking about the high order ambisonics and the kind of immersive um, sound fields, we we're often talk about these ideas of immersion, envelopment and engulfment and where the sound kind of washes over us or surrounds us and envelops us and so on. But we don't often think about enmeshment, this, this idea that we're actually enmeshed in that sound field and part an active participant in the sound field. Um, and so I've done a little bit of work um, in the past with wave field synthesis and here actually over the summer um, doing some work at MPAC in New York and they have like a big wave field um, system, a very nice one. And so here we have um, 512 loudspeakers in a line, um, not, not terribly long line even at that, they're quite small. And when you put all of these loudspeakers together you can make sound objects appear at any point in three-dimensional space and move them around and so on. So this starts to get to this idea of a measurement where I can really bring a sound directly up to you and move it around you and make it disappear back into the loudspeakers and so on. And it's a fabulous tool to use. But as you can imagine, it's pretty difficult to tour and find a really good quality wave field system just there ready for you to use. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's costly and so on and so forth. Um, so when I started working at EARCAM earlier in the year, um, I had intended to start working with Wavefield and unfortunately there they've had problems with asbestos in the Grand Salle and so it wasn't possible to use their main Wavefield rig there and that left me thinking how else could I address this problem. And at that point of course I started to do a bunch of, I was doing VR development for the phones and I started thinking oh maybe I could put some of this on the phone and then I looked more carefully into research that's been going on at EARCAM now for some years, um, the COSMA project, project looking at actually the phone, everybody's phone as an instrument and of course then I thought wait everybody has a loudspeaker in their pocket so if I have 100 people in the audience I actually have another 100 loudspeakers in this room and why don't we think about how we could actually use those loudspeakers as an integrated part of the spatial audio system of the work. And so this is where I'm going to hand over to Benjamin, whose name you'll see up here, um, because Benjamin's been working on the Cosmo project and is the brains behind the programming on the work that we've done this year. And he's going to tell you a bit more about this, the technical aspects of this system. Then I'll come back and we'll kind of share the floor a little bit and then we'll demo it and play stuff on your phones. And so at that point, we'll ask you to get your phones out. All right, here's Benjamin. Hi. Um, so I'm Benjamin Matuszewski from IRCAM and so um, yeah, uh, Cosim the COSIMA project has started uh, I think in uh, 2014 uh, and it stopped last year. Uh, it was mainly dedicated to, so uh, coming from the idea of collective interaction because I work in the, in interactions on music movement team. Um, and the idea was to take uh, web technologies because uh, as Gerf said, every device um, can be seen as a little computer with a lot of sensors and, and a speaker, which is nice to make music. And everybody has one. And uh, web technologies are now started to get mat mature enough to have um, some 2D, 3D rendering for graphics. We have the Web Audio API, which is still new, but can allow us to make some kind of quality sound. And we have um, 
all sensors, uh, gy gyroscopes and um, accelerometers and stuff. And also the most important, um, one of the most important thing in this kind of context is all the networking possibilities and real-time networking. Um, yeah, so this, um, this final aspect allows to make a, a, complex, a system that can be quite complex where we can plug a lot of existing um, systems such as Ableton uh, live with uh, through OSC and then with web technologies speak to, to smartphones or whatever device that can implement these technologies. So everything is made in JavaScript, which is a programming language that works in web browsers and also on we can make server-side uh, code with JavaScript too. And um, here, so the basic idea is that every device connects to a centralized server and that everybody can speak to each other through, through web sockets. And so in the context of Cosima, we developed a framework which is called Soundworks which allow for clock synchronized every device. So we can do synchronize, uh, we can synchronize audio events. Uh, we handle messaging and a, st a state of uh, application between, uh, across every client. We can create new groups of clients and stuff like that. Um, basically the, um, uh, yeah, it's a bit complicated, but uh, basically the framework allows to handle all the initialization process on the, on the computer, on the mobile phone, uh, such as, um, yeah, initialize the audio and synchronize everything, and then just give a place for composer or developers to just build their own application. And then Future Perfect is um, an instance of Soundworks which works like that with three type of clients that uh, Garth will play tonight, which are used to send events to everybody's smartphones and then control uh, things. Right. <laughs> so actually, can we just go back one slide? Thank you. Uh, okay, so one of the beauties of working with web sockets is that basically you can just plug new things in, right? Um, and it's rather than being a fixed network, it's an extensible network. So what you can see here is obviously all the players, which are going to be all of your phones. Um, but over here, as the piece is developed, um, we have a, what we call the soloist interface, which I'll show you in a second, which is actually a spatialization interface. Um, the granular interface, so we can send out sounds to all your phones and send a granular engine to your phones and, and do the granulation on your phone. And then um, the sample controller, which allows us to load sounds to the phone dynamically across the performance. And I have a whole score here for tonight of when I load sounds to your phone and what I'm doing with them and so on. And so this is one of the things that's actually really a bit trippy when you start working on it, is that because you have a WebSocket interface there, you can just start adding all of this additional function. And because it's all centralized here on the server, you can, talk, you can talk to the phones with all of those um, functionalities at the same time. And I, that's a really cool thing, I think, because most systems, as we design them, they kind of get locked down as we build, you know, the granular engine does this. But here, this is com completely open to, to being expanded to any scale. So we could have a thousand phones in here and be driving this to everybody and then at the same time decide that we need to extend the, the range of control interfaces that are going on. And all of these things are all active all the time. So here's a little video that just shows you the, um, 
the interface that loads sounds onto the um, onto your phones. And we'll do this in a bit, but um, what you can see, they just disappeared there, but what you can see at the top here is a bunch of um, buttons, which are folders of sounds that I've made for this performance. And each of those um, but folders contains either from one sound, which you can see here, um, through to a number of sounds, and some are like 15 or 20 sounds. So what happens when I push one of those buttons at the top here um, is that it randomly allocates those sounds across all of your phones. And so here you can see a folder that has um, a bunch of sounds in it, and you can see, you know, that that some phone, one phone's got one sound, two have got another, four have got another sound. If I then push that button to reallocate those sounds, they would be distributed differently, and this can already introduce really interesting textures where I might send sounds out to you, trigger all those to play, send again, where you get a different sample out of that collection and send that to to play at the same time. And so building up these textures that are running on each device around the audience. Um, this is basically what I was just saying. Did you want to speak to this anymore? No. Um, and so the thing that you will have noticed in the little video is that when I ask it to load sounds to your phone, all of the phones get loaded into this side of the interface. And then as the sound loads to your phone, they disappear out of that column. And what that means in performance is that I've got a very quick way of knowing whether the sounds have loaded and whether some phones are still loading because, of course, different phones have different processes and they take longer. Um, and it's really um, positive reinforcement for me in performance when I look at that column and it's empty. You know, it's just everything's loaded. I am fully can fully spatialise across everybody's phone and off we go. Um, in addition to that, as you saw in the video a second ago, you can see here, down here, those sounds when they're loaded to your phone come up as a button. And when, we, when you log into the system in a few minutes, um, you'll get a colour on your phone screen and a number. And these are representing your phone here. So I have the same colour and the same number on my interface that you have on your phone. Um, so I can I actually know which phone is which. Then when we come to the spatialization interface, do you want to talk to this or you just want me to keep <laughs> explaining it? I don't mind, but... Um, <laughs> you talk to that one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this interface, um, when you come in the application, you can just, it's uh, really simple, but you can just say, oh, I'm there in the, in the room. And then in this interface that, is, uh, that allows to control the, the sound, um, can be played by just touching the screen and then um, moving the screen around, uh, the, the, the touch around the screen. And um, here, yeah, and each time, um, so the small white circle represents one mobile phone and the blue circle represents the, the region that will be triggered by this touch. And then you can move around and continue to play the sound in space uh, across, the, across the mobile phones. Next. Yeah, so this is a little video that demonstrates uh, the granular engine. So one thing I just want to say about the spatialization engine is that essentially you have um, a vector of amplitude which comes from the touch point out to the edge of the radius of the circle. So we can adjust the, the radius of the circle so that can be quite small or it can cover all of the phones in the space. Um, and then as you're moving that around, the distance to the centre point, touch point, is going to be the amplitude of the signal on your phone. The other thing that Benjamin just kind of hinted at is that um, when you touch the screen, it starts to play the phone on uh, the sound on all of the phones. And so as I'm spatialising that around the room, the same file is playing on all phones 
and synchronously so that you get this continuous sound that's evolving across the space. It's not like it just starts playing when I get to your phone. And this is what allows us to do the kind of spatial quality and you'll hear in the performance tonight the way in which the sounds come from the loudspeakers into the phones and move through the space and back into the loudspeakers and so on. And so that's all to do with the fact that everything's clocked and synchronised and the files are all playing simultaneously on your phones. Um, this is the granular interface, <clears throat> and I'm just going to run this actually back and start that again. And what you'll see here um, is a similar, the same set of buttons up the top with sounds. Sounds here waiting to load, um, phones waiting for me to tell them what to load. They've loaded the sounds, and now you'll see that there are four granulators. In other words, there are four samples here, and so that sample and the granular engine have been randomly sent to everybody's phones across the space, and then I can start and stop those playing here. You'll see in a second that, in addition to that, there we go, this granulator, each granulator has a whole set of parameters um, to do with typical granulation parameters to do with, you know, um, grain length and inter-onset time and so on and so forth. And one of the key things about the way this system's working, you can see it again there, um, is that there's also a release envelope. So whether I'm triggering a sound to play on your phone, spatialising a sound to play on your phone, or driving the granulator, there's a release envelope that's adjustable on every sound. And so I'm using this often at quite long lengths, like eight seconds on the granulator, sometimes 10 seconds. And this means that you can start these sounds playing quite quickly or start the granulator and then turn it off and you get this nice tail and then start it again and turn it off. And you can build these quite interesting textures because of the benefit of that um, release envelope. And that's programmable per sound. Um, so this just outlines that. You can see here a set of parameters it's associated with each granular um, engine. And, and you have to imagine that not only are the sounds being randomly allocated to your phones, the granular engine is being sent to the phone. So the granulation is actually happening on the phone. It's not like I'm not streaming any audio to you. All the processing is happening directly on your phone. Um, so this is early in the year when we were starting to build this system and you can see there the different colours and numbers that get allocated to the phones. So this project is also a virtual reality project and so originally I was building everything in Unity. Of course the problem with that is that I then need to get Apple or Google to approve my app so it can be put up on the App Store and then you need to go and download it. Um, the piece is like a 50 minute piece with, you know, video, VR video I shot in Paris earlier in the year in the early parts and VR animations and so on. So if you have to go and download it from the App Store, it's going to be a big download. And all of that is obviously kind of problematic in a whole bunch of different ways. So when we started working so much in the web audio area, I started looking into web VR and again, this uh, would allow me to serve the whole visual content of the work to the browser on your phone and give you a headset to put your phone in and put on. Um, and this was where uh, I was hoping to be for tonight. Um, and we've built a bunch of this stuff and Google were going to give us all these headsets. And unfortunately, at the last minute, they brought out a new version and told me they wouldn't give me the old ones. So we have a film tonight instead of <laughs> a bunch of Google headsets. But in order to do that, um, in the VR world, you'll be able to walk around the space, the concert in the space. And so earlier in the year, I did a lot of work looking at tracking systems. And this is a little app that I built in Unity um, using the NaviSense API for tracking, which doesn't require any external infrastructure because in some concerts, you just don't have you know, an external Wi-Fi system or um, you don't have GPS or whatever because you're underground or whatever. And so it's, it was important to me to find a tracking system that required no external infrastructure and just use the gyroscope and accelerometer and compass in the phone itself. Um, so this is an example of me actually walking around my virtual little world in Paris and you can see heading and um, uncertainty percentages which are really useful um, being reported there in real time. Um, and here is a diagram, is, a, is actually the track of me walking around the, the, 
the underground part of EARCAM uh, multiple times to see what um, drift there would be in the path and therefore how accurate this would be as I walked around. In fact, the um, accuracy turned out to be really very good in most cases. Um, and so as I've continued to get the VR version ready um, where you'll be able to walk around the concert, each person will appear as a little cloud in the space because I'll know where you are. And that means that you'll dynamically move around the spatialization map. And it also means that you'll be able to walk around in the VR because you'll know that the other clouds in the space are people and you're not going to walk into them. <laughs> So the benefits of taking the project entirely onto web audio and web VR is, are these. Obviously, there's no gatekeeper. I don't have to get Apple and Google um, approving the app to be distributed. Um, you don't need to download anything on your phone in advance, so you don't come to the concert and find that you need, you know, a gigabyte download and you don't have any room left on your phone to do that. Um, the other really great advantage is as soon as you log in, you get the most recent version of the code. So we made a couple of small alterations this morning. And then of course, as soon as you start the server again, it serves the current version. So you're never actually troubled by having an old version on your phone or a mixed set of versions on phones that are in the space. Um, we can obviously perform it anywhere and I'm really interested to go on developing pieces for phones only. And then we could do them in parks or outdoors. We could basically do them anywhere that I can get a single power outlet to plug a router in. And so you could have guerrilla type concerts anywhere in the city where you just send out a tweet and, okay, we'll have a concert here, be there at three o'clock and take a router and just plug it in and have a concert. Um, and that I find really interesting because it, it's, it kind of explores new ways of making music as a community and it also gets away from some of the constraints of like the institution and the curatorial process and, and all of the infrastructure that we need here to create the things that we do here. Um, and of course, it, it brings the audience into the piece as an active member and that brings back the kind of enmeshment idea that I spoke about before, because you know, if you come to the concert tonight, you will be an active loudspeaker in the work and that's, that changes your role in the work. Um, there are still some challenges. This is obviously experimental work. The protocols for you know, web audio um, are still very fluid. Um, they're implemented on some phones, not on others. The protocols for web VR are completely cowboy fields at the moment. <laughs> Things work one week, they don't work the next, etc. So it's really you know, still evolving space. But it's clearly going forward and it's clearly going to become a major space. Um, the web audio platforms are already quite stable and generally reliable. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is the loudspeaker in your phone is not equivalent to these beautiful loudspeakers hanging around you. Um, so the sounds that I'm sending to your phone and what I'm doing on your phone have had to be designed for the frequency response of the loudspeaker on your phone. And in fact, that if you compose that carefully and think about orchestration of those frequency ranges, that works very well. And you can have some inconsistent outcomes. Some of the Apple phone, the I've, what is it, iPhone 5, for instance, um, can have some uh, grain, uh, granularity in the gain control that causes clicks and things like that. So, you know, there's some, still some inconsistency, as I say, across the platform. Okay. I've kind of said this already, but the high order ambisonics is beautiful and I love it to death. And it gives us this fantastic enveloping and engulfing qualities, but it's not a meshing in the way that adding you as a loudspeaker in the space is. So let's get on and do some demos. So the first thing, if you'd like to get your phones out, and actually that's kind of unique. This is a concert that you'll come to at eight o'clock where I say, please get out your phone and turn it on and turn the volume up. Um, so we need to change the sign on the door that says turn your phone off. <laughs> um, and uh, you do need to go into flight mode or aeroplane mode first because um, some Android phones at least, if you leave them connected to your phone network, will keep looking for this address elsewhere. Um, once you've put flight mode on, go and turn on your Wi-Fi and connect to this Wi-Fi network called Future Perfect. And then once you've done that, please open a web browser and type in fu.tu.re. 
and when you've done that, you'll start making sound. So as soon as you logged in, we sent you a sound and a granular synthesis engine so that your phone would start making sound. Um, the purpose of that is so you can see that it's working, but now you can also adjust the volume of your phone so that it's turned up and, and you can hear it really clearly. Um, and one of the challenges is, for instance, that really new phones are much louder than phones that are a year, couple of years old. And so that allows you to kind of balance the, the volume with the people that are sitting around you. Um, in general, you should turn your volume up to pretty much full um, because otherwise, it, especially when we're working with all the other sounds here, it gets lost a little bit. So I'll just give you a second to connect, to adjust your volume, and then when we're ready, we'll go on. So what you should see is that the screen's turned a particular colour, that colour's unique to you. It's got a number on it, that number is unique to you, so your phone has been registered with the server. It's a unique, has a unique ID. We know where you are in the space. I can send you stuff. We can, the server can talk to you. Um, what's, um, what's also happened is um, that, as you can hear, you're getting sound and then you've been reported back to me. So do you mind, can I pull that image off as everybody who needs that memorised what it says or because I want to show you the interface on the iPad now. Anybody still need that? Future perfect and future. Okay. Okay, awesome. So that's my iPad. Um, so you'll see on your phone that it also tells you some things. It tells you a, play, a file that's set to be played back on your phone and it also tells you about a file that's set for the granulator. Now the reason that we put that text there is that if I send you a new file, as I'm about to do now, you will see that change. So you can see all the phones up on the side there. You can see the sounds loading onto the phones and oh, somebody else just joined and phone number 12 is taking a little while. Okay, 12, you're not loading. I don't know why that is. Oh, there we go. It's just a bit slower. Okay, so you can see everybody is now loaded with a new sound, which is Paris um, scooter and air brakes. And um, if I, I could play all of those sounds directly on your phone by triggering them on the, on the interface that you can see here. But if I go to the spatialization interface, this now shows me where you just told me you were in the space. And so these dots are your phones in the space, um, the top of the screen being the front of the space and the, the bottom of the screen being the back of the space. Now, if I turn off the granulator, that will stop. And now if I um, touch this screen, um, you'll see first of all at the top here, um, the release envelope length. So I'm gonna leave that up at eight seconds. And then you'll see here the radius. So if I make that very small like that, and I put that over that phone there, um, that's gonna be somebody Okay, there you go. So that's just one phone playing at the moment, right? And I could choose somebody down the back. Somebody who's playing down the back now? Somebody over there. Yeah, okay, cool. And so you can see that this radius allows me just to control very small spatialization as we move through there. If I make the radius bigger and I now grow that... Just turn that off. Um, and we now start and grow that through the space. You'll hear this sound growing into the space. Right, so you felt that kind of filling in and now you feel that kind of enmeshment thing that I was talking about, which is this sense that as that plays in the space here, that suddenly the gaps 
start to get filled in. So if we take a different sound, I'm doing all this on one iPad, which is not optimal, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, okay, this is a musical sound. Again, we just wait for that to load up. And here you can see there are multiple sounds in this file. So I've, I've thought about orchestration in terms of timbral variation of these files. Um, I could play them perhaps just on a single phone. So where's phone number zero? Who's zero? Oh, that's me. I'm down here. So, um, okay. Well, I'll just play four of these sounds and you can hear them just play. So five. You can hear that there. 15. It's quiet. Three. Over there somewhere. 17. So you can hear all of these sounds are within the same aesthetic range. So they've been orchestrated to be variations on, on the same thing, right? So if I just trigger all of those to play simultaneously, then again, you'll get this kind of field of sound. And one of the things that I've learned this year as I've developed this project is by making these small variations in the files and sending you slightly different files, I get this kind of really lively texture, which would otherwise be very flat, right? But now it has a texture to it that you can feel kind of is alive in the space. Now, what's really cute is because I've sent that to play, I'm going to reload them. You're going to actually get another probably randomly allocated, so you might not, but get another sound. And then I can play that on your phones at the same time. So now you've probably just got a slightly a different variation that's also playing on your phone. So both of these things are now playing on your phone. So this is a really interesting thing because we're building up layers here, like threads in a programming language, but we've basically told the phone, play this file. And while it's playing it, asked it to play another file. So then we could ask it equally while it's doing that to load some completely different sound and start playing whispers on your phone at the same time and load up uh, something else, for instance. And so now if I go back to that original musical texture and go back to my spatialization interface, um, what I can do is, while those other sounds are still playing because they're much longer files, spatialize and move this across the audience. Now, these are, of course, sounds are at completely different amplitudes and so on because they're designed to go at particular points in the piece. You can already tell that when the voice is in later in the piece, it's much louder than when we're in this more meditative space earlier on in the piece. Um, and for instance, if we go to crickets, oh, hang on, I have to refresh the interface. These are quite long files. Okay, and then if I go back to my Solist interface, and now I can kind of grow these crickets into the space. Etc. right? So you get that sense of how that builds an atmosphere in the space, which is quite different to the quality that we would get out of the loudspeakers here and how that can fill in the space. And so, in fact, these crickets start in your phones tonight and will grow into the loudspeaker and slowly the, the kind of world expands out in using the high order ambisonics as we go. Um, so... Uh, I guess I should show you the granular interface. Uh, you've still got a few minutes. And then we'll do a little performance. 
Okay, so this is the granular interface. You'll see at the top here exactly the same sets of, of audio files. I have a preset um, state here which loaded onto your phone when you um, connected. And um, if we just, come on, load, if we play that, you'll hear that familiar <laughs> sound at the beginning. Um, so if I go, for instance, to one of the other sounds that pops up later in the piece, and here you can see again that there are four variations, and I'll have to put the iPad down to do this, but if I start and stop them, you'll start to hear this varying texture that grows in the space. Um, and remember here, so if we look at the variables here, um, most of these are set with a release time of 10 seconds. So then when I start the granular system, it takes, and stop it, it takes 10 seconds to die out. So you get something like this. Right, that's off with the release tail. And you can hear each time the granular process starts, you can hear that same starts at the beginning of the file go to a different one. You can hear the grain, long grain length here, right? It's that kind of like... And then some of them that are more textural, I can run longer. So you get that, that kind of string sound, and then you can get the attack on the others there. And then I've got all three interfaces on separate iPads here, so what I would normally be doing is doing this and triggering the sound at the same time. So if we do that, uh, let's just go back. So here you can hear those underlying sounds that are playing and then the, the variation and the kind of liveness of that texture that's generated from the uh, granulation all happening at the same time, right? Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Have I missed something? Right. Cool, so should we just do a tiny little kind of teaser performance for tonight? Um, and then we're, of course, happy to ask, answer questions and so on. So I'll just go back here. Okay, so this audio that you're going to get in the background is just a little bit of footage from um, Paris that I shot earlier in the year, which developed as part of our kind of demonstration earlier in the year, um, and some animation that's also part of the performance tonight. Um, it's much developed from this tonight. Um, the audio you're going to hear is just stereo off this film and the phones just for demonstration purposes. Tonight it'll be full order, high order ambisonics.
Thank you. So um, that gives you a tiny little taster um, for what's going to happen at 8 o'clock tonight. I hope to see you there. And um, I don't know, do we have time for questions now or are you going to do that at the panel or what would you like to do, Luca? Just two or three minutes, one or two questions, if there are. Wir haben nur ein Mikrofon oder haben wir mehr als eins? Uh, yes, I wanted to know why the colors are changing and why the colors are changing, the sounds change too. Okay. Um, each time that you log back into the system, so every time you refresh the browser, you get a new unique number in the system and it gives you a unique color to the screen. So every time you refresh your browser, you get a, a new, it's like you're a new phone now, right? And, and then it discards the old entity. Um, the names of the sounds are changing because I'm sending you new sounds from here. And so the reason they're written on the screen is that you can see that actually it's active and things are happening. And then hopefully you can hear that as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to be honest, I'm more impressed than I actually wanted to be when I came in here. So my question is, what you present now, is this, could this be called work in progress or is this the, the end point of a very long road you have been going? Okay, thank you for your question. So um, the piece, the way in which the, the phone infrastructure is, is implemented and composed for in the piece that you're here tonight is I think is complete and I hope you will agree after the performance tonight, a polished composition. Um, we have a whole list of other ideas <laughs> and you can hear here that there's a lot of potential and there's some already really interesting things happening. And then of course, then we think, oh, but if we did this and if we implemented, you know, open sound control in various ways in the back end, we could do all kinds of other things. And I have all these ideas to compose just for the phones locative works that occur at different points in the city and so yes so so the answer to your question is is that i think this piece is finished and tonight you'll hear these things well integrated this was a very rough little improvisation so you could hear some of the potential um, and at the same time we have a long list of other things that we want to do and of course earcam has and benjamin's team at earcam has their has a whole other list of things that they're developing and many other interactive using the phone as an instrument um, things that they've been developing there so it's the kind of start of a really interesting path i think yeah yeah um yeah, thank you for the impressive uh, presentation really nice I th um, yeah. um, my question is or oh, I, I see another use case i mean uh, we have the mic here i mean you could use also the mic of the yes. of the uh, mobile phones to um yeah to communicate but question would be um uh, did you make experiments um how many uh, mobile phones you can have in the um, in the area so I guess uh, there's some limit do you make experiments with this so I think we should both give an answer to this but I've um, the the access point over there the little blue light uh, is rated to 200 connections you can put many of them together um, in my head when I'm when I you know I've been developing I'm thinking oh I'd like to have a thousand phones you know, like to do a big concert with just with lots and lots of phones. Um, I've had a couple of hundred phones um, to date, um, but of course they've done actually a lot of work with this at EarCamp. So Benjamin can probably tell you more about how many phones they've had and how obviously the system is extensible. So I don't believe there's a limitation other than processing power and bandwidth on the router, but he might tell you something else. <laughs> uh, no, basically the bottleneck is the Wi-Fi. Um, in terms of system performance, with this kind of architecture, I really don't know because it's really hard to test, yeah. basically. <laughs> but we've made things with 150 people, 
without big problems because the uh, Node.js is something that is developed for huge companies such as, uh, I don't know, PayPal or something like that. So it's quite strong. And for really, really large, but I mean really large, maybe 10,000 people at the same time, there would be probably need to make really architectural change that are really not trivial to, to do <laughs> and that we won't probably do anyway. Because. Okay, then there's time for one more question. Um, did you try experimenting with uh, calibrating it? So, for example, you could put a microphone somewhere and then measure the frequency response of the average num device or maybe even like if you have a small group of people, you could have multiple microphones and try to triangulate so that you have a correct position or something like that? Um, that's to work out where the phone is. Yeah, so for the concert tonight, you see the screen that I've made a little seating map and you just tell me. Um, but but um, I, what I've done is to develop this API that I showed you earlier. Uh, oh, sorry. So this is the NaviSense API. Um, so um, basically the plan is that you would connect at the door. I know where you are at that point, And then it's dead reckoning from then on. This would mean that you could move anywhere in the space and the map would be dynamically updated at any point. So that's all we need really then. It's remarkably accurate, yeah. Thank you.